All right. You guys can hear me okay? Awesome. Sweet. Well, uh, how you guys doing? Thank you guys for coming out to Die Every Play Test Recruiter. My name is Santino. I appreciate each and every one of you guys for coming out and joining me on with this experience. It's pretty awesome. And uh, for those at home, I only imagined about 10 people to show up today. Uh, I didn't think a million people would cram themselves in this room to listen to me talk. So now you guys understand the pressure that I'm dealing with today. But uh, <laughs> so we're here to talk about recruiting. Uh, this is pretty much what we're talking about today. That way you guys aren't caught by any surprises. You guys are gonna get to know me a little bit better. Uh, we're gonna talk about some recruiting stuff. Making the recruiting process happen. So before the call prep and the calling process. Some metrics and some key takeaways. So quickly about me. I was born, I played some games, I got some experience, I got some more experience, and we're here now. Sweet. So last year I spent all year as Activision's sole playtest recruiter. I recruited for hundreds of studies, I made thousands of calls. I don't know how I survived, but I learned enough to present here today, so that's pretty cool. As far as what recruiting, go, or what recruiting is, uh, let's get into that briefly. So what is recruiting? Recruiting is bringing specific people to the labs to get an outside perspective on our product. These are your consumers. These are the guys that are going to wait day of release to pick up your games or wait for a play test and get the game for free. But uh, as far as why it's important, the developers have a really cool idea, but it may not be easy for your average consumer to understand this idea. So it's great to capture their feedback, and that's recruiting in itself. As far as recruiting at Activision, we have a high volume of players, which brings on a ton of studies. We get two to four studies a week. Reason why is that we deal with multiple platforms, multiple genres, and that's all fun. With Activision recruiting, we, we also deal with a lot of tight turnarounds. So we get like two weeks notice, which is ideal, hopeful. Sometimes I get five days notice where I got to recruit 100 people to commit to two days, and we ended up having 109 people show up, so that's pretty awesome. Where I find these people, we get them through an internal database that we created using a registration survey that the team sat down and we wanted to bring out the core data that we wanted to use to create random samples with. So that's what we have. We have uh, this data is made up of dedicated fan base, uh, consumers, and adults, since most of our stuff is rated M for mature. Now, a lot of depart or a lot of user research teams use either internal recruiters or only external recruiters or a combination of both. And here are some reasons why those options are pretty great. As far as internal recruiters go, they have access, direct access to the research team, which provides immediate feedback. So like for me personally, when I'm talking to somebody and I'm going through these notes and we're doing the screening process, I'll write this stuff down. And if I'm not sure where they fit, I'll copy those notes over and send them over to the research team and ask them, hey, does this person fit? I'll keep the conversation going, buy some time, and see how that goes. And that's really great. That helps out a lot. As far as uh, flexibility goes, Studies change, objectives change, dates change, times change, and an internal recruiter has that flexibility to change the recruiting right away. We recently had a play test where it was a two-day study going on originally, and the developers asked, hey, we want to know more information. That meant we had to add an additional day to this study. So it went from two days to three days, and they were so nice to let me know three days before the play test. So I had to change it up. Out of the people that were already recruited, I was left with one person that was still available. Out of the people that I recruited last minute, we had an 80% show rate, so that was pretty cool. And internal recruiters also cost efficient. They save you money. They don't come with those recruiting fees that some of the external recruiters have, and that's pretty much it there. They also uh, have an intimate product knowledge when, you know, for me, I walked into the Activision building. I played Spyro as a kid on PS1, and I thought, all right, I know a lot about Spyro. When I actually walked into the building and I had Spyro fans in front of me, I had no idea what I was talking about, and I was like, oh, man. How do I not talk about Spyro ever again? It was terrifying. So being surrounded by the games that we make, we have that knowledge there to, to help us out during the recruiting process and talking to people on the phone about these games. As far as quality control goes, we have access to the database so we can see who's blacklisted, who's a repeat participant. We get familiar with these guys, and that helps bring in the, the, the uh, participants in the, into the lab. With external recruiters, they have a wider database, so they have access to people that aren't fans of our games that aren't gamers themselves. They may not know that we actually do testing on, on games, uh, so they have access to, the, to that in their database, as well as kids. If you're doing any play tests that need, or studies that need kids, external recruiters are great for that. They're full with that. 
As far as a dedicated team goes, where I mentioned I was the only recruiter for Activision doing all those projects that I worked on, uh, an external recruiter may have five to 10 people that are recruiting for your, your project, which helps fill a playtest faster and you can worry about the other stuff. Uh, so that's great. With gratuity, they, there are times where the, the external recruiter will handle the gratuity for you, the incentive, why people come to, to playtest. And that's great because that helps us avoid talking to the IRS and having to deal with those tax forms, which nobody wants to deal with. These guys also have to recruit for various industries, different needs. So they bring that varied experience to the recruiting, uh, to your projects, which is great. As far as making the recruiting process happen, we're going to get into that, which is a lot of fun for me. I get to talk to a lot of people with have uh, different backgrounds, and that gets pretty intense. So let's talk about it. When you're talking to your, to your recruiter, what, is, what, do you, what are the things that uh, the recruiter should know from the researcher or the researcher should know from the recruiter? It's important to know that the uh, project conditions, so the recruiting conditions, right? What do they have to play, their, their past game experience? Uh, can this person use the, the keyboard and mouse on a PC or they, they only play with gamepads, stuff like that, uh, that you'd want to know in the, the like, profile you're looking for, essentially? You also want to know the study objectives. So again, if you're doing a PC study, is it important that they know the keyboard and mouse, how to use it, the proficient with it, or do they just need to know how to navigate around a computer and, and that's all the information they need? So these are the things that, that I need to know before I start making my calls to see who's right for this project. And of course, knowing games is super important before you, you uh, start recruiting. So when you're talking to your recruiter, let them know what games they should catch up on. For me personally, I had to learn a lot about the Soul series I don't know if you guys have played Dark Souls or Bloodborne or anything like that. I uh, tried Dark Souls 3, I was getting my butt kicked, and then I stopped playing that game. And then I got a job at Activision, like, hey, you gotta play that game now, and I was terrified. Uh, so I, I have different methods for doing this, watching YouTube videos, there are a ton of streamers, big guys, little guys that get 20 views, whomever. As long as you get the information and you use that, that's awesome. So watching uh, YouTube videos is one of the ways that I did it. Playing the games is another way, so actually immersing yourself into that. But that may be time consuming. You may not have enough time to, to actually play enough to know and, and do these calls. Uh, but one of the things that I did when I was working in sales is that, I, you know, as you guys know, gamers are very passionate people. So if, if you are not playing a game that somebody else is playing and they love that game, they will take the entire day to dedicate to you, to educate you on this game that they love. I'm sure you guys have experienced that. <laughs> so what I did in sales was I would take that experience and use it to sell it onto somebody else so that they would buy that game or, or pre-order that game. The way I do it now is that I pick up on the terms that people are using, I pick up on their, their, their depth of knowledge, their, their excitement, and when I call people to recruit them, I'm seeing if they're using those same terms, right? If we have to recruit a hardcore fan of a certain game, are they using those terms? Do they have that same level of, of knowledge as this person just explained this game to me? Or are they like, you know, some people are, are timid, they won't show that excitement, but do they know the, the other things around it, those terms and stuff like that? So knowing games is incredibly important. So these are some steps that we have here as far as what the recruiting process looks like, right? So in a database, or uh, using our tool that's our database, from that we use it uh, to create a random sample. Once we have our sample, we send out an email blast with the survey. This will have the scheduled dates. It'll have additional questions that, from information that we want to filter later on. After we get their availability, we screen them via phone call ask them to verify the, the, the stuff that they, they put in, and then we confirm them, let them know, hey, you are gonna take part in this playtest. So at the end of this slide, I thought, all right, cool, I'm gonna have a really cool acronym, but I got stuck with SK, so that kind of sucks. But, uh, so there's that there. Now, when it comes to, to playtests, there are some groups that we wanna exclude for various reasons. I'm gonna go through some of those reasons with some of these groups, but here are those groups. So uh, people that have direct or personal industry ties, professional gamers and streamers, they are kind of uh, high risk for leaks. If you have that personal tie with somebody that, that works in a different video game company, you may feel comfortable letting them know, hey, I just played this game for Activision because that person also works in the game industry. That's still breaking the NDA. If you're a YouTube streamer and you want to get your views up, hey, how about you check out my stream? I just have this new information on this new game that I tested over at this other company. So you want to avoid that. That's uh, a little bit scary. As far as pairs go, the reason why we want to avoid pairs like siblings, roommates, people that are in a couple, is that they may uh, share their, their feedback with each other, and that'll influence each other's feedback, which we want to avoid. When we do play tests where it's like a group setting, so like back in the day when we did Guitar Hero testing, we would bring a family in. 
we would do our best to, to remind them, hey, please do not share your thoughts of this game uh, with each other. Leave it for your survey. But even then, we don't know what happens when they go home. So we want to avoid that. The gratuity cap, like I mentioned, nobody wants to talk to the IRS. That's, we're going to leave that there. Now, long distance is really important. Uh, we all come from different cities, and, the, and long distance may be interpreted in, in a different way for the different city that you're coming from. Because in Los Angeles, although I may be five miles away from my destination, it could take me an hour and a half to get five miles. So when you're recruiting for, for playtests, keep that in mind. Because you're going to have playtesters or, or participants that show up, they're exhausted from the drive, they're frustrated from the drive, and that may roll over into their feedback. It may not look so great. One of the things that we do is that we have this uh, regex formula in our tool that we use to, to pull samples, and it has every zip code within fi uh, 50 miles of our headquarters, and that's how we limit that, essentially. Of course, it's pretty plain and simple. I can't bring a six-year-old to playtest Call of Duty. That's that there. And repeat participants. The reason why we want to avoid repeat participants as, as far as like, bringing them in too soon or, or if they get too comfortable with the team is, is that we had a uh, playtest go on back in December where this guy showed up, and he, was, uh, he had playtested a few times. He's being really friendly with the research staff. And this intimidated one of our playtesters, where they pulled me aside and they asked, hey, does this, act does this guy work for Activision? Are we in this room with other Activision employees? Like, he didn't want to be there anymore. And that, that was, you know, I let him know, no, he doesn't work here, and then talked about it a little bit more. But those are some of the things you want to avoid. If somebody's too comfortable in a room, it, it dominates that, and, and yeah, avoid that. Now, as far as what happens before the call, make sure you know your product. How many of you guys have played Call of Duty Black Ops 4? Nice. Uh, so for those of you that have not played Call of Duty Black Ops 4, I'm going to spoil something for you. There's no campaign. The game does not contain a single player story mode. So the very first time I called somebody and I, we were talking about the games that they play and they mentioned, hey, I'm playing the campaign in Black Ops 4, I was taken aback. I was caught by surprise. Now, I understand most people don't like phone conversations anymore. They, they only text now. So when you're in a phone conversation, I'll remind you guys, it's very live, it's in the moment. I can't tell this person, hey, I'm going to put you on a brief pause, brief hold, and figure out how I want to respond to what you just told me. So I quickly just responded with, well, what parts have you completed? And then he started to describe certain missions that he's completed, and I found that he was talking about the Specialist HQ. So for those that have not played the Call of Duty uh, Black Ops 4, Specialist HQ is more of a tutorial mode to introduce players to our specialists. So I knew that. So when he started describing that, I'm like, oh, he's talking about this. I can't fault him for his interpretation of our modes. I just have to know the game so well that you can describe it in one word, and I'll know what you're talking about. That's pretty much that there. Now, always double check and keep a constant communication with your researchers. So confirm the required conditions, uh, check for disqualifiers, uh, know your testing objectives, because those may change with no notice. Uh, double check with the researchers, so again, that constant communication. And Check for previous screening notes. So for me personally, I take very detailed notes. The reason why is that when I first started, my very first month, I call this guy up. We're talking about a game. I'm asking him questions. He doesn't fit. So I thought, all right, I don't have to write any more notes. This guy doesn't fit. We'll leave it at that. A couple months go by. I call the same guy again. I recognize his name. I try to go find those notes. I can't find the notes. We go through the questions again. He doesn't fit. And I'm like, hey, man, I'm so sorry you don't fit. A couple months go by again. I'm like, I know this name. Let's go check it. I go check the notes again. The notes are terrible. We go through the questions again, and he doesn't fit a third time. I feel terrible about it. That same day, a couple hours go by, he sends me an email saying, hey, I no longer want to take part in your program because you guys keep calling me and telling me I'm not good enough for you. And that was the worst experience. I found that there was a play test going on three weeks later that wasn't finalized. It wasn't for sure happening, but he fit that. So I talked to the research staff. I said, hey, how confident are you guys that this is actually going to happen? I got this guy. He fits. Can I put him in there now? So we did, and then we got him back that way. And I learned from that, I have to make sure I have notes, I have to make sure I have a system where I can go and recall and not ask the same questions. But we'll get into that later. I have a slide dedicated to notes. Now, as far as making the call, what I like to do is treat the call more of a conversation than an interview. So when I, when I start my call off, I say, hi, this is Santino with Activision Playtesting. May I speak to so-and-so? Now, something very interesting happens a lot of the times where I'll get the Los Angeles attitude back. When I have that opener, they respond back with, yeah, what do you want? And then they start figuring out who I am, and they're like, wait a second, who's this again? When I say Activision again, they get really, 
job interview style. Hey, sir, how are you, sir? And it gets very formal. It gets really weird. I don't like it at all. So to get away from that, I have to switch the conversation around. I have to like open it up a little bit more. One of the tools that I use is uh, another interesting thing that happens on the phone. Because I call from Activision, they want to only talk about Call of Duty or Activision-related titles. So what I like to do to open it up in more of a conversation and, and get that, that level of comfort is I start talking about games that aren't related to Activision. Let's talk about Rainbow Six Siege. Let's talk about Hotline Miami. Let's talk about these other games so that you know you're talking to somebody that's, that actually plays these games, not a recruiter who is just trying to get you somewhere. So we switch that around, and, and uh, there are people that, that uh, still have that, like, they're, they're too formal on the phone still. And once we dive into the games, it, it becomes that conversation. And, I, and it's my job to pull the data that I need from this conversation because it gets a little weird. We talk about games that I don't really care about, but we're there. We're doing it. We're living. Now, in this conversation, it's, it's important that I have information that I need. But when there are times where they're, they're, they're inflating their experience, I need to have catch questions ready to see are they, if they really know what they're talking about. For me, at least, catch questions are almost always kind of freestyle. It's more my knowledge of a game, and that helps me think of a question on the spot. The reason why is like, uh, it's, it's you know, from that past gaming experience, and I've grown up to think quick on my feet. You know, that comes from being bullied as a young kid. People would say, hey, you're ugly. I'd come back, hey, your mom. They weren't ready for it, caught them off guard. It was great. So you see how quick I am, lightning. So. Uh, have your catch questions. You can have them pre-rehearsed. You have some lines down. If, if we're talking about this mode, write out the, everything you, you know about that mode and, and try to develop catch questions through that. Or just know the game well enough and freestyle them. It's fun. One of the more important things, and it's really hard because our job as recruiters is to talk people through the phone, but reading your participants. The reason why, I don't, I don't know if you guys have seen that show, Lie to Me, but there are a lot of tells you can see in somebody's face when you're talking to them. But on the phone, there's not much I can see. One of the things that's always fascinated me when, I, when we start talking about the favorite modes and favorite maps and stuff like that, people will mention all of them. They're perfect. You've made a perfect game. I enjoy every aspect of this game. Nothing's wrong. I'm like, what? Because I've played games. There's something wrong with every game that I've played. So one of the things that I'll find is that once they start realizing, hey, I've told this guy that I'm an expert in this game, but I have no answers for him, they'll play this game of bad signal. I'm talking to him, asking questions. They're like, hey, man, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you repeat that question? What they don't know is there's a microphone at the bottom of their, their phone, so when they start typing on their screen, looking up the answers, I can hear that type. So they come back with this expert knowledge of answers, and I play this fun game where I start asking really small questions where it's like, you're not going to know this. And they come back and they know, and I'm like, ha, I caught you. But then other times, it's, it's you know, again, knowing, knowing just people as a whole. We have playtesters or participants that are very shy and timid. They, they're afraid to ask me, hey, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question you just asked. Can you rephrase it? So it, it's my job to find that balance. Where, where are they at? Are they trying to mislead me, or are they just not sure what I asked, how I asked it kind of thing, right? One of my favorite things that's ever happened on a phone call, I'm talking to this young lady. We're, we're going through you know, conversation, talking about games. And then somehow she walked into a cave, because I would ask a question, I'd hear the answer, and then she would echo that answer back to me. I was like, this is interesting. So I'm going through, I'm going through, and, and her boyfriend's giving her the answers. And then he, a he answered one of my questions, but the, question was, or the answer was wrong. So instinctively, I was like, oh, no, I'm sorry, that's wrong, before she could even tell me the answer. So I ruined their whole plan. <laughs> and they hung up the phone. We never talked again. But those are some of the things that, that uh, those are some of the challenges that we have as far as recruiters go, because we're re we have to read these things over the phone. A lot of fun. Now, I've mentioned this several times, taking notes when you're, when you're screening. Those notes can be formatted however you want. The reason why, um, or the, the way that I take notes is I'm taking notes for the study that I'm recruiting for today and in any future possible play tests. Again, I just go back. We have a system where we've talked about the gratuity part, logging that, making sure you don't go over. When we log that gratuity, we, we also log the date of the play test they were in. So I go back to that play test, I copy those notes, paste them into my new file, and I'm reading that. It saves me time. I'm not going to talk about the same thing we just talked about the last time we spoke, let's talk about some new stuff. This saves time, and time is money. As far as, oh, sorry. As far as uh, what I have here, this is an example of uh, some notes that I took recently. We have a play test going on this Friday, so I'm still recruiting this week. If any of you guys are interested, let me know. Uh, <laughs> but here we have the platforms they play on, the games that they play, their experience in some of those games, 
and games they're looking forward to. So now I have different stuff for, for different games. If we're doing any future benchmarks, I know this person's excited about the game. They pre-ordered the game, stuff like that. As far as disqualifying goes, for me personally, it's all about the message. I try my best not to tell people, hey, you're not qualified to be in this. I'm rejecting you, which is a weird sentence to, to tell somebody. Uh, I, I deliver a message where it's, or sorry, um, it's important to do that. The way that I deliver mes my message is, is that I manage their expectations. I explain the process to them. I let them know it, this play test wasn't a fit for you. We have some other dates that are scheduled. As soon as those dates get finalized, I'll give you a call because I wrote down what we were talking about verbatim, and we have that stuff like that. That way they know they don't, they, their mentality doesn't shift to the next time somebody calls me, I'm going to inflate my numbers and lie to this person. At least now they know that they do qualify for some stuff. It just wasn't this one. I do it for, for a very specific reason, because the, the way your message is delivered can have a terrible impact on not only your database, where they no longer want to take part in your, your playtest, your program, but they also will not support your, your games, not support your company if, if you deliver that message wrong. Now this person thinks, you know, this, this guy keeps calling me, telling me I suck. I'm not buying those games anymore. So that's super important. Think about the way that you're coming across. It's um, that emotional intelligence factor, essentially. So here we get to a point where what happens when I don't have enough people and I need more people to recruit? These are some of the things that I do. As I mentioned, we send out a, an email survey blast to give them the, the scheduled dates. They tell us what they're available for. If I need more, I'll keep sending out those blasts. People to, that have not been contacted. That's very important. You want to avoid multiple attempts on the same person, as that might create like a disturbance or an annoyance. You keep calling me. I'm not picking up for a reason. I'm sure we've all done that. And again, notes are super important. So let's say the email blasts aren't working, and I can't, or not the email blasts, but like this, the way that we're, we're filtering, we're trying to create these samples aren't working. I go through past play tests, and I'll read through the notes. Then I will personally create a list of people and then put them through our, our tool that we use for our database and create a random sample through that, pull out 30 out of 100 or something. Uh, so I keep going back to this because it's so important, but make sure you're taking detailed notes uh, for any recruiters out there. And of course, having that constant dialogue between recruiter and researcher is important. If you know that there's a very difficult profile you're looking for, somebody who's never played video games, never opened their eyes or something like that, check on the status of that profile recruiting. See if there's any details you can switch or change to open up that profile a little bit more to help with the recru recruiting efforts. And as a last resort, you're getting closer to the date of the playtest, cold calls. For those of you that don't know, cold calls is when you call somebody without any advance notice. You're just calling out of the blue. Those are a last minute tactic because they may also create a disturbance, may also create an annoyance. Hey, I did, why are you calling me? I didn't know, I didn't sign up for anything. So what I like to do, or sorry, um, so what I like to do is I treat these from a customer service perspective. Hi, this is Santino with Activision Playtesting. I just want to check you're receiving our survey emails. Is everything going okay? That's the, the approach that I have. And then once we get into some of that stuff, then I'll be like, hey, I have this thing coming up. Are you free on this date? And then boom, that's how I work my cold calls. Again, notes part three. Let's say I can't, I don't have time, it's too late. There's a last minute ask for a play test. I cannot create a sample with our tool. I'm just gonna go through past play tests, look at notes, and just start cold calling people down the line. One of the biggest things is you have to prepare yourself mentally. When it comes to cold calls, it's not that successful. You're calling somebody randomly for something that may happen tomorrow or two days from now. You have to prepare yourself mentally for that no. I get voicemails back to back. I get people that tell me no back to back, and that can be very discouraging. I'm very confident the study's gonna get filled, but I tell myself mentally nobody's available, and that, that helps it out, for me personally. I don't know if that works for everybody, but that's just me. Cool. So on to over-recruiting. So when it comes to over-recruiting, if you ask for somebody, or if you ask 20 people to show up at a certain place, how confident are you all 20 people will actually show up? Right, you'll have a few people that won't show up, and so we over-recruit for playtests using alternates. And when I, do, when I call people for, this, for, for an alternate spot, I like to explain the pro process to them. I explain to them that this is a backup spot, and I go through it in detail. That way they, they know what to expect day of. You're not guaranteed acts, or inside uh, a chance to play, but you will still get paid. It takes about 15, 20 minutes for the check-in process to see if you are needed or not. And if you're not needed, you're given a $50 Visa gift card. Who does want to get paid $50 for 15, 20 minutes of their time? So there's that. 
As far as guaranteeing them to come in, we have some, some ballers in our database where a $50 Visa gift card, that's nothing. They don't want to show up just for that. So I let them know I added this little bit at the end to help out with retention because I saw that alternates weren't showing up. I said, or I say now, uh, you will not, only, not only would you get paid $50 in a Visa gift card, but you're also going to be the first person I call for the very next play or for a future play test. That way it guarantees you a primary spot. So I look for a play test they fit in, and then we, we go to that essentially. So that helps out a lot. That's picked up our uh, alternate or backup show rate significantly, so that's great. Cool. On to canceling. Canceling can be very tricky. Again, same thing with rejection. It's, it's the message that we, we deliver. So again, I approach this with a customer service mentality. If we're canceling a, a play test that's going on this week and it's Monday, I can see if we have something else going on the same day, the next day, and that shows a little bit of effort. Hey, I'm sorry that we canceled this one, but here's what I also have that you qualify for. If uh, the study gets canceled the day of, we let them know, hey, you're still gonna get paid for your time. This is our bad. We're so sorry. Here you go. And most importantly, something that I learned, and, it's, and I learned this from the almighty Drake, uh, know yourself, know your worth. For me personally, I don't know if you guys can tell, I'm very monotone. You can't tell if I'm excited, if I'm mad, I'm angry. So if I'm doing these calls where I'm calling somebody, I'm saying, hey, your place has got canceled, and I call the next person, hey, I'm sorry, your place has got canceled. After 10, it ends up being, hey, it's canceled, and that's it. So I have to know myself and know how I operate, so I like to take breaks in between calls. So I only do one call, and then I take a break because I know myself. Sweet. Now we're going to get into some metrics for all you number fans out there. For every 100 surveys that, we get, that are going out, we get an average of 30% 30, uh, 30 in terms of responses. That's helped out a lot, and there are different reasons why, why that is. Uh, we've changed up the tool that we're using. Uh, the message in our surveys changed as well, so various reasons. So if you're not getting that uh, percentage that you want in terms of the, the response rate, uh, look at your tool you're using, or look at the survey and see what, you, what wording you can change, what verbiage. Typically, Surveys go out seven to 10 days before the first scheduled play test. We like to include multiple dates on that survey that we send out. So the, the survey will go out seven to 10 days before the calls will start the very next day, and then we try to have a play test full four to five days before the actual study. That way, if anybody cancels between that time, we have time to make that up. Like I mentioned, cold calls aren't that successful. For every 20 calls, I get one person that's available. But uh, that's okay. As far as how many people I get for a playtest a day, on average, it's about 12 people that I confirm for a playtest. Uh, sometimes there's more, depending on the, on the time, stuff like that. And as far as the cancels go for our playtest within the last couple months, it's been about two. We've had two people cancel per study. So I've only had uh, one playtest last year. It was a 30-person playtest, and everybody showed up. I was so excited. I bought a frame. It was awesome. We've gotten down to 85 to 90% show rate, which is great because that means I don't have to sit in and play the game and get my butt kicked and then get made fun of, hey, you work here and we just beat you. So people are showing up, so that's awesome. As far as, oh, sorry, now we're at key takeaways. Again, I've talked a lot about that constant communication between researcher and recruiter. That is super important. That's what's helped me out the most in all of my recruiting, whether it's I'm bugging them writing on Skype, or I'm running up the stairwell, talking to this person and I can't breathe. But that dialogue, is, is, it, it helps me understand them better. So a few things that I've done to, to help me not only understand profiles, but understand the way that I should be talking to these participants. I've sat in group discussions and watched the way that different researchers ask questions in, in those group discussions. I've uh, just sat in meetings that I'd, I found myself, I should not be in this meeting, but let's see how people talk, it's pretty awesome. And then that's pretty much it. But so yeah, so always check on your recruiter. Have that dialogue there. Of course, knowing your product. You don't want somebody to lie to you, and then they show up, and then you tell your team, hey, this person said they actually did this. And then your team says, well, that's not in our game. That's terrible. It's embarrassing. And for me, at least, one of the takeaways is turning the recruiting process from a in job interview style to a more casual conversation, like we talked about. It, it eases the, the conversation where it's not so much uh, I'm trying to sell myself to you and show you that I'm, not, I'm at the skill level that I'm not actually at. It goes into we're just talking about games, and that's pretty much it. Customer service mentality goes a long way. 
for whatever it is, rejections, cancels, it's, uh, it's that, that PR perspective, right? You're, you're saving face, essentially. And taking detailed notes so you can do a callback, save time, save money. You have all the information you need there. The conversations don't become stale. If I keep calling you for a playtest and I ask the same stuff in the same format, playtesters are already going to know what the jig is and they're going to tell me all these answers that I'm like, well, you didn't say this last time. But the a casual conversation, or sorry, taking detailed notes, I avoid asking the same questions and, and basically exhausting people. Sweet. And that's pretty much it. Awesome. <laughs> so now we have time for questions. If anybody has any questions, we're going to set up a mic here and you can line up. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, yes, sir. How many are, of you are there in your group? Like, are you doing all the recruiting for the whole group? or uh, Definitely, yeah. So it, for our team, just me, just one person. Um, I understand that other teams have multiple internal recruiters, but for, at least for us, it, it was just myself. Uh, we have none, so I'm all, oh, okay, excited cool. <laughs> about that. So, so we rely on uh, screeners. It's, that was my other question. You're... Uh, your screener survey that you send out, does that just have availability on it or is that that ask like other pre-selection questions? Yeah, so we do, uh, we send out availability first. If they're not available for anything, that way we just knock them off the survey. But uh, we do ask questions around the current games they're playing, uh, the, the modes that they're playing within those games, depending on the, on the game and, and of course the, the play tests that they're signing up for. So yeah, we have that additional those additional questions to have to later filter that's not included in our, our core data. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about building that database of players that you have to get that recruitment. Um, and, you know, both in general and more specifically, kind of how you ensure um, diversity in various ways to make sure you have, you know, whether it's gender or age or job or, uh, you know, play style or, or things like that so that you, you know, aren't just recruiting from like one group of people. Okay, I can imagine that could be, be hard to get. So how you build that database and how you ensure you have all these different things you might need to meet different types of requests. Definitely, yeah, that's an awesome question. Uh, so we sat down as a team to figure out the, the, like, the core data we wanted to sample, but we have questions that are around all different genres within the, the video game industry. It's not specific to the genres that we make, but we, to have that inclusion when it comes to, to the, those genres. We ask questions about the platforms they play on, PC, mobile, console, stuff like that. Uh, there are um, other questions for, for inclusion, so like you're asking, that we do ask gender and, and stuff like that for more um, background. And as far as the, the construction of that survey and, and how we built it, it's, um, it was a long process. We took a week to dedicate to the survey since we know that, that this is the first thing that these guys are going to see and we don't want to keep bugging them with, with other questions. Uh, we wanted to, to nail it down. So it was a long process, but um, every need is different for every company. So just figure out what, you're, what you guys need it's in terms of like the, the people, the participants you want it in your playtest and then have those questions ready. I guess if, if you don't mind, it's more like, I'm thinking specifically about like finding those players in the first place. Oh, like where gotcha. You, how you recruit them into your panel and ensuring that you get, you know, different types of players there. Definitely, yeah. So uh, one of the things that we do is on our Activision website, we have uh, this pop-up. If you're within 50 miles of our headquarters, the pop-up will say, hey, go to this website and register for this play test so you can get paid for your opinions on games. I mean, that's not the, the exact verbiage. That's me paraphrasing. But um, so we have that. We've had other things where we go to college campuses and say, you know, we represent this team and tell them that there. Uh, but that, at least in my experience, those are the only two things that I've done. We had this, uh, a large database before, and it was more of like that. We went to different gaming events and just networked essentially to, to sign up. Okay, thanks. Deli. Uh, do you have data tracking on players' usage of Activision games, like which game they played and how much to help you recruit players? Definitely, yeah. So we ask questions about what um, the specific Activision games that they play, and then within, like, let's say, Call of Duty, we ask their, uh, for them to tell us their proficiency. A lot of the times people will, will tell me, hey, I'm an expert in multiplayer on Prestige 10, and they have that in the, in the initial survey. When I call them, that's not the case. They're, they're a little bit lower. But 
it, that, that's why we have both. We have the, the survey, and then we have myself who goes through the questions, and we screen them and stuff like that. But are we, oh, sorry, go ahead. Outside of surveys, do you have like hard evidence like linked to their account? Because you have their email address, so right. most of the time it links up to their Activision profile, I guess. Gotcha. Um, so having like, yes, and you play for 80 hours or more on COD 4? No, so we, we, our tool is, is uh, limited right now, or at least we're limited within using our tool, so we don't have that data tracking for that. Um, so no, unfortunately. And uh, follow-up questions, how do you deal with extremely long play tests? Like, I worked on AC Odyssey, and it was like by the end, two or tr three weeks of testing. Definitely. Um, that got to a real challenge, get players available for that amount of time, and we opened up for evenings, weekends. Uh, is this something you do? How do you deal with schedules in those times? Yeah, so I've had different experience when it comes to that. We've had long-form progression studies that are like five days, um, and ideally, I'd want you know, enough notice to let people know, hey, are you available for, to block out these five days to come in and play test? Uh, there were times where I only had two days notice to recruit a few people for five days, and that was difficult to find people that, that have that availability. But um, it's, it's really in just the timing of, of sending out that first email blast saying, would you be available for this? As long as I had that timing down and I sent it out right away, I, I had enough people that could potentially move that, their schedule around to fit that. Um, now, in the cases where I only had a few days to recruit for a long-form study like that, um, it was just cold calling until I had enough people. It was no real, like, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Definitely. Uh, thanks very much for your talk. Uh, been really interesting to hear it. Uh, so I'm a researcher, and uh, what you described in terms of being embedded in the studio and like calling directly and being familiar with the games, that makes a lot of sense. But uh, uh, where we're at, we're frequently dealing with uh, external recruiters just to make sure that we can get all the people we can get. Definitely. And one of the things we run into is, as you mentioned, uh, people kind of inflating you know, their experience or misrepresenting it. Uh, do you have any uh, suggestions for or how to deal with that when maybe you don't have the resource of someone who's super familiar with the games to actually have a conversation with people. Definitely, yeah. So uh, it's really hard for us being, you know, so involved in games and knowing our games so well that we have these specific terms that we we use. Uh, just kind of having a conversation with a casual player to see the types of terms they use, and then passing those terms on to the recruiter, and that'll help them. If they're not a gamer, they'll just see these few words and, and they'll know what they're talking about in a sense. Um, but it, it's essentially that, is just trying to make it as, um, as like small of a, of a detail as you can and not make it so complex that you know, we're so familiar with the game and, and we already know these things. Um, but yeah, in, in your screener, when you're passing it off to your external recruiter, just trying to find the, the casual terms, essentially. Okay. Thank you. Definitely. So thanks for the talk. Uh, so kind of when working with researchers, are there any study requirements that they ask for that they don't realize are really hard to ask, successfully ask about on the yeah. phone? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot. There are so many. <laughs> My favorite one ever is, uh, can you find us a person that plays an FPS but has never played this FPS? Now this FPS, I don't know if you guys uh, are FPS fans, but the very first first person shooters that you play, at least in my experience, Call of Duty, Medal of Honor, SOCOM, and some Counter-Strike for some people. If you ask me to find somebody that's never played one of those games, that's impossible. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's insane. But yeah, I've, I've been asked that, and uh, we found one person, and it was exciting for me. I was like, holy cow, oh my gosh. Yeah, it was awesome. But yeah, other than that, it's, there have been asks, and we got to sit down, and, and uh, it was weird for me at first. I had to get comfortable with telling the research team, you guys have no idea, these people don't exist. But, uh, um, but it's very important to open that, that dialogue and open that comfort with your recruiter so that they can feel comfortable saying you know, that exactly. Because I will waste two weeks trying to find this impossible profile, and now I've wasted so much time because I'm looking for unicorns, essentially. Well, thank you. Definitely. We're done. <laughs> awesome. Thank you.